Good morning, guys. We're in Revelation 3. I'm going to read 14 to 22. To the church in Laodicea, to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put in your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so to be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with the Father, with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let me have a sip here. Ah, lukewarm. That's part of a joke. <clears throat> if you were paying attention, the church in Laodicea has been accused of being lukewarm. The very thing that I hate most about coffee is when it's lukewarm. I like hot coffee. I like iced coffee. I do not like room temperature coffee. Same, same with french fries. In fact, the only thing I don't like or the only thing I hate worse than lukewarm coffee is room temperature french fries. I'll just throw them right in the trash. At least with, with coffee, you can put ice in it and maybe make it cold. With french fries, if you microwave those, they're just soggy and gross. Amen. Yeah, it's, I mean, really, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. If you love french fries as much as I do, which is almost as much as I love donuts, then it breaks your heart. Laodicea is a wealthy city. It's the seventh, the final city we get to talk about this morning from the letters of Jesus to the seven churches. These are bound up in a circular letter that was sent from place to place in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. And we've talked about each of the cities along the way. And when possible, we gave historical insight and background. We built context, and then we put Jesus' words in that context to help them come alive and then apply them to us today. This morning is no different. The problem is the church in Laodicea is a little more like us than we would care to admit. Even worse, Laodicea is the only church that has absolutely zero commendation whatsoever. They haven't done anything right in the eyes of Jesus. Or if they have, he's afraid to let them know because of all the wrong they really need to focus on. It's really a heartbreaking letter. The last one, and seemingly the hardest hitting. Revelation 3, 14 to 22 Again, if you want to turn there and follow with me, we'll, we'll be looking at these verses, but we'll also be considering how it applies today. Laodicea wasn't just lukewarm. That reference is, is not merely an analogy, but a very practical part of life for the late Laodicean Christians. And I say that because of their physical location. Geographically, they're located between Colossae and Hierapolis, which are two ancient cities, one that you know, the Colossian church, and the other one you've probably never heard of, Hierapolis. So you have Colossae and Hierapolis. Colossae had mountains with mountain runoff, that really cool, refreshing, clean water filtered off the mountain, uh, and people loved it. it. It was refreshing. It had good taste. It, it didn't have a lot of the problems other local sources of water had. So people would go there to find refreshing water, and the people who lived there had access to that cold, refreshing water. It was a blessing to the Colossians. Likewise, in Hierapolis, their water had purpose. It wasn't cold mountain runoff, but they had hot springs, not really to drink, but to bathe in. They would get in these hot springs, and they had healing properties. Even today, many people believe that hot water or hot baths can help with things like arthritis. We know that warm water, especially mineral-rich water, natural water, has inherent healing properties. And so when we say hot or cold, Jesus wasn't saying, I wish you were good or bad. He's saying, I wish you served a purpose 
Hot water can serve a purpose, cold water can serve a purpose, but this lukewarm junk does nothing for me. So what's he talking about? Well, right between those two cities, between the mountains and the hot springs, was a city that was sort of landlocked with no access to potable water, nothing they could drink. And so they piped in water with these small aqueducts, and when they piped this water in from distances away, in the sun, the water would become lukewarm. It would get, uh, get kind of hot not hot enough to be useful, just warm enough not to be refreshing. And in the process, it would, it would pass by who knows what kind of minerals and clay and stone structures. And however they piped it in, it picked up a lot of minerals and deposits. And so it was hard mineral water that had a stench to it. I know growing up in the city, I had access to really good, clean water because it came out of the Ohio. They had to clean it really good. Uh, so I had really good, clean water in Louisville. But my family that lived out in Adair County, Kentucky, they had well water. And some of you still have well water in this room, I bet. Well water is, of course, in need of being softened oftentimes. It's so rich in minerals coming out of wells, and, and it has a smell to it. To this day, if I shower in well water, I think it smells kind of like eggs. It's got that sulfuric smell. So if you can imagine, that's what they had access to, but they didn't have water softeners. They didn't have water filters. Uh, Sometimes that water probably wasn't even potable to drink. It it was kind of gross. It was the one thing about Laodicea you could not brag about. They were rich. They were powerful. They had a lot going for them, but they had really gross water. And so Jesus picks the one thing that they can't brag about, and he says, this is the problem. You think you have all this going for you, but there's this one thing, by the way, the one thing you have to have to even live, water, the most important commodity you have access to, and that's the one thing you don't seem to really get. And then he relates that to their spiritual health. He says, you, you think you're rich, you're powerful, you got all this going for you, but you don't realize how, how bad off you really are. You're self-deceived, you're deluded, you're confused. The message today isn't necessarily a happy one, but I think it is an appropriate one, a fitting message for many of us to hear. Because unlike Hierapolis or Colossae, our lives often do not give healing or refreshment to others or to God and his kingdom purpose. Far too often, our lives appear to be lukewarm and useless. The accusation Jesus makes here isn't that the church is too rich. It's that their riches have blinded them to their kingdom purpose. They have become useless, which is probably the worst thing you could say about a person, that they are totally wasted. Some of you in this room probably feel like your life has been wasted, that you are perhaps useless. And I would tell you this morning, Jesus has not given up on you, and he has not given up on the church in Laodicea. I drank some of this lukewarm coffee at the beginning, despite uh, how, how averse I am to it. Uh, I drink it because I'm, I've got cotton mouth. I have to have something to drink. But normally I would not. Uh, and I tell you this because pretty much every afternoon I have the option to drink lukewarm coffee. And that's because every morning I make hot coffee and I make a cup for myself and a cup for my wife, who's just up here. And, and I give her that cup of coffee and I kiss the kids goodbye and I leave. And when I come home, I don't know, six out of 10 times at least, there's a half cup of unfinished coffee sitting on a dresser or a counter somewhere that is lukewarm. And if it had coffee creamer, because she doesn't drink black coffee, uh, she drinks cream with a splash of coffee. And so it's, got, it's usually got a gnat floating in it from some time in the day that landed in this sweet cream. Uh, so anybody know what I'm talking about? Those half-finished cups of coffee? I hate that. Not only does it feel like a waste of, of such a precious resource like coffee, and I make good coffee. Worse than that... It's the fact that it's just sitting there serving no purpose, and now I can't drink it because it has cream in it. If I heat it up, it's probably going to coddle or be gross, curdle, I mean. It's going to be gross, right? Uh, so, so I don't want that. And then if I put ice in it, it's old and stale. It's not going to taste very good. It's just kind of useless. So I pour it out. I rinse out the mug, stick it in the dishwasher, and I do this every day. Uh, and, and it just, she said I could tell you this. It gets old. But it's a little thing, right? It's one of those little things spouses just have to learn to live with. I have a lot of little things. I chew my nails when I'm reading, and at night I read a lot in bed, and I chew my nails, and she smacks my hands and says, please stop, please stop, and I never stop. Um, I have no nails. Uh, So since COVID happened, I have been more careful uh, with chewing my nails, but don't worry. I sanitize and I wash my hands. I understand if you don't want to give me high fives later. I didn't think before I shared that detail. In all seriousness, I don't like lukewarm coffee, and I bet most of you don't either. 
Just like we don't like room temperature french fries that aren't hot anymore or melted ice cream that's warm sitting out in the sun. It's just certain things that if they're not hot or they're not cold, then they're kind of wasted, they're useless. May it never be said that we as a church have become useless, wasted, that God gave us gifts and abilities and then we flush them down the toilet. And why did this happen to the church in Laodicea? Jesus says it's because of their affluence, their wealth, their stuff. Jesus had a lot to say about stuff. Matthew 19 and Luke 12, which we're going to look at this morning. Paul in 1 Timothy, which we'll look at at the end. But first, let me tell you a few details about Laodicea, how wealthy they really were. So we talked about Ephesus, right? Anybody remember whether Ephesus was a big or small city? Raise your hand if you think Ephesus was pretty big. It's not a trick question, just seeing if you remember. Okay, you didn't raise your hands. It was. It was big. It was one of the biggest ancient cities. Ephesus had probably 200,000 residents, which is a lot more than Gallipolis, Ohio. 200,000 people in an ancient city. And they had one amphitheater, one theater that they met in, which was a sign of wealth. Every major city had a theater. And uh, any guesses how big Laodicea was, population? Let's throw something out there. It's not 200,000, I'll tell you that. 40, 40, who said that? Were you in first service? No. It was exactly 40,000. Thank you, Josh. That's why you read the scripture. That was prophetic. Yeah, 40,000 people. That's crazy. I cannot believe you guessed that. 40,000 people. I have a question for you after service about a big decision I'm going to make, okay? I'm going to ask you about it. 40,000 people. They had two theaters. Big, big, wealthy cities like Ephesus still only had one theater for 200,000 people. Laodicea is so wealthy, they built an extra theater just to show pride in their city, to show how wealthy they are. That wasn't enough, though. Laodicea, during the earthquake of AD 17, received funds from Rome, like many of the cities we've talked about after that great earthquake. And Rome said, we'll help you rebuild, and you just sort of owe us a favor, you know, put you in our back pocket. All the cities accepted except for Laodicea. They said, no thanks, we can handle it. And out of their own wealth and resources, they rebuilt their entire city. Laodicea was rich. They were the banking center for the region. They saw more gold and silver than anywhere else. They didn't make it, like another city we talked about, but they had it, and they had it in piles and piles. They were a medical advancement center. They had all the newest forms of medicine, including an ointment for the eyes, an ancient form of ophthalmology, that Jesus references here, this salve to put upon the eyes. They were famous and sort of had a copyright or trademark on this eye ointment. They had a marble trade that was extravagant. All these pillars and statuaries you see in pictures from the ancient world. Many of the, the structures you've seen, that marble probably came from the region around Laodicea. They had a lot of ways of making money and they had a lot of money. The problem is their money had blinded them their stuff had plugged up their ears and deafened them to the knocking of Jesus at the door. And that's the warning that's given. And so it reminded me of things Jesus said. The first one I want to look at is in the Gospel of Matthew. These will be on the screen. Matthew chapter 19. When a rich young man comes to visit Jesus. It's a famous story. Many of us have heard it before. Let me have some more lukewarm coffee. Mmm. Wonderful. <clears throat> Behold, a man came up to him, that is to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Now keep in mind, they had a lot of commandments. If this man was around the Pharisees, they not only had Torah, the law of Moses, but they had Mishnah, which were these oral traditions, all kinds of rules, kind of like church. We have like secret rules that people just sort of know about that aren't in the Bible. They had that back then. They had listed rules, and they told their kids about them and told them to honor those rules. So he says, which ones do I really have to keep? And Jesus simplifies it and kind of boils it down. He says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I've done that. All these I have kept. Another gospel says, since I was a boy, I've done all these things. Basically, since you could hold me accountable, I've been doing it. Jesus said to him, he asked, what do I still lack? 
what else do I have to do? And Jesus said, well, if you'd be perfect. So now he's, he's calling him out saying, I know you're not really asking, how do I honor God? You're asking, how do I prove myself worthy? And now Jesus calls him to task. He says, if you're trying to, to show me that you are perfect, ready to enter eternal life, then go sell all your stuff. Give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And many of you know how this ends. The young man heard this, and he went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. Jesus then turned to his disciples. He said, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples heard this. They were astonished. They were shocked, saying, who then can be saved? Now, understand their surprise. The disciples thought that this rich young man was better than them. That's why he was blessed with riches. That's why he had done so well. He was clearly a good man of God, and their culture would have taught them to appreciate this man's wealth as a sign of God's blessing. And so they look at this man and say, if he can't get in, what hope do we have? A bunch of fishermen and blue-collar people. They feel hopeless. How could any of us be worthy? And Jesus responds. He looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now that verse we've all heard before, right? With God, all things are possible. But many of us forget the context. Jesus was speaking about the inability for wealth to work us into the kingdom of God. No matter how much you have or what you acquire or how much you've proved yourself or proven yourself, there is no way that you can earn a place in eternal life. In fact, the more you acquire and the less you share it, the more proof there is that you are not worthy of God's shared life because he himself gives away rather than storing up and keeping for himself. And so Jesus is trying to teach a powerful lesson here that with man, whether rich or poor, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of heaven. But if you will stop trusting in man, in man's abilities, man's power, man's possessions, and you would instead trust in God, then anything's possible. You can be saved, but only through God's strength, only through that which he possesses. It's a powerful lesson, and it's one the disciples needed, and it's one that disciples today continue to need. And then we turn to Luke chapter 12, two gospels later in your New Testament. Luke chapter 12, and Jesus tells a parable. It's one of my favorites in all of scripture. I say that so much that saying it's my favorite means very little because like half the Bible is my favorite thing. Uh, so it, it really is. This really is one of my favorites because it, it convicts me of the way I often live my life, trying to store up and, and build security for myself. And this is what Jesus does. This guy in the crowd comes up. He says, teacher, he finally has an audience with Jesus. And he says, tell my brother to give me my money, my inheritance, which is already a sad way to start your conversation with Jesus. And Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? But then he said to him, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions his stuff. Then he told him a parable. So that's the context. Rich man asked Jesus, how do I prove myself? Jesus says, you can't. You just don't have it in you. you. You care too much about what you have and what you have done. Now another man comes up hoping to become rich and says, tell my brother to give me my stuff. And then Jesus says, wait a second, you need to be careful. Let me tell you a story about somebody who had a lot of stuff. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my old barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Paraphrase, it's time to retire. Take it easy. Go buy a sailboat. Enjoy the keys. But God said to him, fool. This night, your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now, that's a pretty stark warning. 
And yet right after that, if you look ahead in Luke chapter 12, immediately after that parable, Jesus begins to tell his friends, so you don't have to be anxious about stuff. What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what's going to happen to you tomorrow, just worry about today and God will take care of it. Trust him. It's a famous passage about overcoming anxiety and not worrying about this world and the things of this world. But Jesus tells that encouraging, that encouraging little sermon right after this sad narrative, this parable of a man who cares way too much about stuff, who thinks that he has security in his possessions, in his accomplishments. These are, aren't the only things Jesus says about it, but they're some of the most famous And now I want to go back to the church in Laodicea with all of that in mind. And we consider the warnings Jesus gave that stuff is temporary. God says to the rich man, you fool, your soul will be required of you tonight. Jesus elsewhere said, what does it gain a person to to inherit the whole world but forfeit his or her soul? What's the point? You might have all that there is to have this side of heaven, but if if you have gotten that at the expense of who you are, the image of God within you that that was meant to shine so brightly, if you have to snuff that image out in order to have have stuff, is it really worth it? The obvious answer is no, and yet many of us don't believe that, and so we continue to chase stuff and hoard it and worship it. And Jesus warns the church in Laodicea that they are on the verge of blasphemy. He doesn't use that word, but it's implied. You are beginning to worship and trust your stuff, creating an idol, a God, out of what you have rather than the one who gave you what you have. As people always say in the church, you, you can't worship the gifts. You have to worship the giver, the giver of the gifts. That's Laodicea's problem. They've begun to worship the gifts. Now, you might think, that's too bad for Laodicea. I'm glad that we don't struggle that way. But you're kidding yourself, because we all know this is exactly what we struggle with. We live in the modern Western world. We have access to things that kings and queens would have dreamt of hundreds of years ago. And we we take it for granted. I call it capitalist consumerism. I mean, other people call it that too. But I'm going to call it that. We we used to use the word materialism, but it's more than that. It's, It's not just a personal struggle to have more stuff. It is a system of brokenness and injustice Not just capitalism, which is about as good as any other human-made system, although I would argue none of those human systems ever work. Capitalism's a pretty good one, but then when you put broken humans into that system, you end up with consumerism, where all we want to do is have more stuff, get more, have more, prove ourselves more. It's all about acquiring and hoarding and, and accolades, after your name. You want people to think highly of you and you want them to know you have things and you want the personal security to have that blanket next to you in case things get cold all of a sudden. You can just pull it right on top. We have to have that. A a safety net, people often call it in financial world. You have to build your safety net. That's what the Laodiceans had done. The problem with the safety net is that it replaces the need for God to catch you. And so the Laodiceans had lost sight of their true safety net, the one who really could rescue them from any sort of danger. They were deceived. And Jesus doesn't tell them this to guilt trip them or to belittle them or condescend. He makes it very clear. I'm telling you this because I love you. You you reprove people, you rebuke people, or you discipline children because you love them, not because you want to see them struggle, but for the exact opposite reason. The reason Jesus gives these, these warnings and these concerning remarks is because he cares about the believers in Laodicea. I heard a preacher recently say the Laodiceans are lost and and unsaved and hopeless and that we don't want to become like them. And I think that's a totally wrong assessment. Jesus says right here, I'm giving you this counsel to come back to me and get the things which last forever. Give back this temporary stuff and take what I gave you to begin with. Don't start replacing the good gifts for these temporary ones. Likewise, I tell you this because I love you, and if you hear me and do what I say, you're going to be with me and we're going to conquer. Things are going to be all right. That's the end of the story. But in the middle of that is our own failure, our own faithlessness. Yet Paul, the apostle, says even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. God hasn't given up on the Laodiceans. And I'm telling you this morning, even if you have fallen prey to a consumeristic culture, God hasn't given up on you either. 
Even in moments when you exchange his glory for temporary things, even when your path is marked by selfish pursuits rather than selfless living in the way of Jesus, even then God is still calling out to you, still beating on the door, knocking ever so loudly so that you might open to him. He doesn't give up. He doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't stop caring about you. Just like any good parent wouldn't stop loving their child when they make poor decisions. The problem is consumerism, this culture where we're taught that all we need is more and more stuff. And by the way, the stuff we need seems to be less and less permanent. It's, things become more temporary and we need more of them and we need them more often. That's consumerism. That's capitalist consumerism and it's rooted in human desire for stuff. And it works. That's why there are billboards every five feet in every city, and there are c commercials every five seconds on every channel. And even when you stream stuff, you have to pay extra crazy money just to quit watching commercials. And even then, they slip them in sometimes, somehow. You go on the internet, there's ads everywhere. You, you're always looking at things, always being told to buy things, to, to become things that you aren't. All of that, everything about our culture and, and its focus it's not only a, a deception or a lie, it's also distracting. So let's imagine that some of you as faithful Christians don't fall prey to that. You realize, I'm content with what I have. I don't need more stuff all the time. And some of you have found that contentment. The honest truth is, unless you live in an Amish community, you still have the constant distractions of this sort of broken system. And even they have that when they visit Walmart and stand in front of the wall of TVs, right? We've seen it. You can't escape it. That's not even a joke. I've seen it multiple times. Or when they stand out behind the barn with a case of, of you know what and packs of you know what. There's, you can't escape it. You can try, you can pretend to, but you cannot escape the broken systems of this world. And so Jesus calls us back out of them. He gives us something better. He at least offers something better. And he invites us to open the door and receive it. He's talking about a world that's empty, and then he invites us into his own house, which is full of love. A world that gives promises and doesn't keep them, or makes promises and doesn't keep them. And then he says, but you know, I'm the true witness. That's how he started the letter. I'm the true witness. I'm the one who was there at creation. We say the only begotten. It, it literally means the only one of his kind. Jesus is the only uncreated son of God. He is eternally coexistent with the father, meaning he was there when everything was made. He wasn't made. He made the things that are. So he's saying to you, all that stuff you treasure, the things that make you feel secure, I made all of that. I made you, and I tell the truth. That stuff is just stuff that I made, and there are enemies who lie to you about it and, and make you think that you're safe, but you're not. In fact, you're hurting yourself, and that's what he says. Here's what it comes down to. You, you think you think that you've got it made. You say you need nothing, you've prospered, you're rich, but you don't realize, verse 17, you don't realize you are wretched, pitiable. The, some of the Bible say pitiful, translations say pitiful, but it's pitiable. You're not full of pity, you are meant to be pitied. You are pitiable. You're poor, blind, and naked. Those last three, Jesus gives clear cures for. He says, I counsel you, meaning I encourage you, I, I charge you to do this, to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. You think you're rich, but you're actually poor. But if you'll buy my gold, you will be rich. What he means is treasures in heaven, good deeds and righteous deeds for the father. If you will do the works that I did, those things are stored up forever. Those are treasures that lie in a place where thieves cannot break in and steal and moths cannot destroy and uh, rust cannot harm them. He says, put your treasure there in my house, the gold that is already refined. The Bible speaks about that refined gold as the righteousness of the saints. We are the gold that is being refined. So he's saying, become the people that I purchased you to be. And then he says, white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. These people had all the clothes they wanted. And Jesus says, you think you have clothed your shame, but your clothing only further proves the shame underneath. I offer you something pure, undefiled, a way of actually clothing your shame, your guilt, your past. This morning, some of you don't just feel poor, you feel shamed. You feel guilty. And you've tried every which way to overcome that guilt and that shame. Perhaps you've read the books, you've watched videos, you've asked friends for advice, you've asked for prayer, but you still feel guilty. You still feel shame. Jesus says, I have garments of white that will actually cover your shame. 
that will cover your nakedness. In the Garden of Eden, God made clothes for Adam and Eve in their nakedness. He made those clothes out of love. He didn't want them to be ashamed. Likewise, he doesn't want you to be ashamed. Jesus offers what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't become truly rich apart from his righteousness in us. We can't cover our shame and nakedness apart from his righteous robes upon us. And then finally, he says this salve for your eyes. The, the very ointment you're so proud of doesn't cure your spiritual blindness. You can shove it all over your eyes all day long. And Jesus says, but, but I'm the one who made eyes with my own spit for a blind man mixed in the mud. I made eyes. And the eyes you're trying to heal aren't even the ones we're talking about here. He's talking about their spiritual vision. He says, you don't see how broken you are. You think you've got it together, but you're falling apart. And there are moments when you know it. That's why he says this to them, because they know deep down, like many of us, that they don't have it together, but we're good at faking it, aren't we? We're good at pretending and even convincing ourselves that we got it together. He says, you tell yourself we're fine, but you know, you know you're not fine. You know it, and I can help you. I can help you see the truth. Jesus offers cures for all of our sin sicknesses. It's the creature comforts that they had become accustomed to, the things that we too have grown accustomed to, those things that make our lives comfortable and yet always busy, seemingly wonderful and yet full of despair and depression, apparent wealth that leads us to feel miserable at the end of each day. And we all pretend it isn't happening when teenagers kill themselves in our local schools, when adults overdose every day in the streets, when people have seemingly no reason to live, and we just keep on running the rat race, acting like everything's fine. It's not fine. It's not okay. And Jesus says, I can help you see. I'll help you admit the truth, and then I will heal you of all those sicknesses. But you have to trust me. As long as you think you can fix it, you are deceived. All of this he offers out of love. It is because of my love that I reprove you, that I counsel you in this way. That's what he says. And then he says, I'm waiting. I stand at the door and knock. Verse 20 is, is an active phrase in Greek. It's saying he's, he's standing and knocking at the door. It's not like he did it a while ago and you should have went and answered. He's still there. He's still knocking. He's still waiting. He says, come and open the door to me and we can come in and eat together. You with me and I with you will have this, this proper communion, this proper, this proper arrangement where you and I are together at last like we were supposed to be. But you have to make room for me at your table and you have to open the door. And to open the door, you have to hear me knocking. And to hear me knocking, you have to pull the junk out of your ears that has deafened you to my call. What is that junk if not the possessions and the, the stuff that they have built up for themselves? He says, until you give this up, until you stop worshiping the idol of mamna, stuff, you can't love both God and mamna. You can't love God and your stuff. He says, until you give it up, I can't come in and be with you. But there is an, an ability to give it up. There is a way in which we can be with Christ, and he's waiting and knocking. We just have to let him in. This is really good news. It sounds so depressing at the surface, but it's good news. We don't have power, and we have to admit that. But he has all the power, and he's come to help us. Would you stand with me as we wrap this up? And the worship team could come back up here. Riches, money isn't evil, but it does create temptations. It creates opportunities for trusting in oneself or staking claim on, on the stuff we've acquired instead of trusting in the God who continues to give life and to give it abundantly. The stuff we have, the busyness of life, the, the system we live in, the, the society in which we live is so busy and cluttered that we are deaf to the call of God when he knocks at the door. We are blind to our own sinful shortcomings. And it's not like the sin is something that Jesus wants us to see so we can feel bad about it. He wants us to see it so we'll come to him to get it healed because he doesn't want to watch us suffer anymore. Paul talks about this. This is how we'll wrap up. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is talking about people who are trusting themselves rather than trust excuse me, rather than trusting in God. And I want these thoughts to help prepare our hearts for the Lord's table this morning. That's where we're headed, to the invitation of God. And that's what we're going to find here 
as Jesus continues to knock and call out to us. This is what Paul writes. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You sense in Paul's wording here, not, not an anger toward these people, but a pity. They are, as Jesus said, pitiable. You feel sorry for them because they've pierced themselves with many pangs. Jesus isn't warning us about the allure of the world and its broken systems and, and the desire to have more and prove ourselves more. He's not warning us about all that so we beat ourselves up or feel guilty all the time, but for the exact opposite reason, so that he can heal you from that sickness, take away your shame, and restore you. He's tired of watching you pierce yourself with many pangs. He loves you. And so Paul adds, but as for you, O man of God, speaking to Timothy, I might say to you, O men and women of God, and this will be our charge this morning that leads us to the Lord's table. Flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession. In the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's pointing to the very message of Revelation, isn't it? That Jesus is coming back. He says, just hold on. Don't, don't fall prey to this junk. Don't let these systems fool you. Jesus will display at the proper time his own glory. Verse 15, he who is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That is our charge this morning, to allow Jesus, the King of kings, to rule our hearts, to rule our lives, to trust in him rather than in our abilities or our stuff as many of us are so prone to do. And it sounds like common sense, but we need reminders sometimes daily, not to fall prey to those broken systems.